So we're doing Ezra and Nehemiah, let us uh, rise up and uh, build. That's the uh, name of the series, lesson number four. This lesson entitled, Building Up Without Compromise or Fear. So far in our series, we've uh, concentrated our lessons on the people of uh, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And our thoughts and teaching points have largely dealt with how people reacted or the qualities that people had during this period of time. We've kind of looked at the people involved. So in my lesson this morning, I'd like to look at the process, the process, how it affected these people, the tasks that they were given by God. How did that work out? You see, the basis for the story in Ezra and Nehemiah is the rebuilding of the city and the wall and especially the temple in Jerusalem. This, of course, is, is the backdrop against which the characters and their lives and their decisions are played out for good or for, uh, for evil. So let's work our way through the uh, different stages of the rebuilding process and see what happened to the people who were involved. We talked about the people, now we're going to talk about you know, the things that they had to do. In the Bible, from managing the garden to establishing the church, God molds and shapes people's lives as they work out some process in his design. So we begin with stage one, which is the beginning, Ezra chapter three, and we read, now when the seventh month came and the sons of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brothers, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brothers arose and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So it's 516 BC, and after researching those who could return, as well as priests and Levites who could legitimately serve in the temple, the men are gathered to begin the actual work of rebuilding in Jerusalem. And this work is led by Jeshua, who is the son of a priestly line, and Zerubbabel, who is the son of a kingly line. And so the excitement of the beginning uh, is a clear vision of what is to be. Uh, whenever we start some project or something big, Usually we see in our mind's eye the glory of the finish line and what it will mean for us. We're going to build ourselves a house and we, we, you know, we see the plans and there's nothing, the dirt isn't moved yet, but we, we look at the plans and we look at the spot and we, just, we could just see it, how it's going to be. But between the plans and the final, <laughs> the final uh, you know, nail, in the, nail in the house, you know, there's a lot of stages that go in, a lot of discouragements and so on and so forth. So the same thing for these, uh, these people, for these Jews, uh, freely released uh, uh, from uh, forced exile and then returned to their homeland by the order of a pagan king who would then underwrite their travel and cost of rebuilding their holy temple. I mean, this was nothing short of a miracle. Nobody would have ever thought the pagan king is going to release us and he's going to pay for us to go rebuild the temple. That, I mean, that's a miracle of God. People are excited. So for these people who agreed to return and we need to remember not everybody returned. I mean, they had some that went back to rebuild, but a lot of people just stayed in, in Babylon. They, you know, they had businesses, they had farms, they had life. Uh, you know, why go back there? Everything is desolate, the things are broken down. We, we have a, a new life here. So not everybody uh, wanted to go back. But for the people who agreed to return and rebuild not only the temple, but their homes and their society, this meant that after many generations of silence, God was with them once again. God was with them once again. That was the exciting part. They were truly his people again. I mean, they were sent to exile. Why? Because they had been disobedient and God punished them and there was silence. But now God invited them back to be his people again. And more importantly, he would accept their worship offered according to the law of Moses at the, uh, at the temple. And so this was an exciting, uh, an exciting start. We also learned that they begin to organize the Levites, you know, the temple servants. 
so that they could begin the actual construction of the temple on the foundation that was, the temple was initially laid. Now the chapter ends with the scene of rejoicing as the people are moved when they see the outline of the temple in the foundation. You know, like they see the plan. Wow, we can almost see how it's going to be because they see the outline. Uh, the outline. Of course, their joy is mixed with sadness at the thought that this temple, this new rebuilt temple, when it will be finally finished, will still not be able to match the grandeur of Solomon's temple, which some of the older ones remember from their, from their past. So uh, uh, although they were afraid of their enemies, uh, they suffered no interference yet. As with all new beginnings, uh, there was excitement, everybody was together, uh, but the next stage uh, soon appeared and the next stage is opposition, opposition. Like all projects, it wasn't long until the first of many obstacles occurred to derail the process. So we read in Ezra 4, now when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's households and said to them, let us build with you for we, like you, seek your God. And we have been sacrificing to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the father's households of Israel said to them, you have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God, but we ourselves will together build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia has commanded us. So the enemies that are spoken of here are what would later be referred to as the Samaritans. They claim to also be legitimate worshipers of God, but their historical reference is the king Esarhaddon, who was the son of the Assyrian king Sennacherib, and he was the one who destroyed the northern kingdom and dispersed all the people to foreign lands. A little detour here to understand a bit of history, the Assyrians their policy for conquered nations was to dilute their nationalistic fervor and fidelity by mixing them with other nations. The Babylonians who succeeded them in world domination had a different policy. Their approach was to retrain and immerse the leaders of the defeated nations into Babylonian culture and art and politics and then use them in their own court uh, as uh, counselors and uh, leaders, and also return them to their former lands to govern uh, on behalf of uh, Babylon. These two systems produce the different results that we read about in Ezra and Nehemiah. For example, the Assyrians under Sennacherib and later his son Esarhaddon sent the people uh, back uh, who were no longer Jewish. Uh, they had not only been mixed culturally because they had been forced to take foreign wives and husbands, but they were also mixed religiously because they had also adopted the gods of their pagan spouses. In approaching Zerubbabel and other Jewish leaders, they could claim some historical connection, but their bloodline and their religion had been compromised in such a way that they could no longer be allowed to participate in temple worship. The Babylonians, on the other hand, had permitted the Jews they captured to maintain their cultural and religious integrity. That was very important. They didn't have to go to Babylon and take on the Babylonian religion. They were left alone. When they permitted them to return, that meant that they were, there were still many Jews who had not married outside their nation. And they had also maintained their religious heritage while they were in uh, captivity. The result was a people who had a historical, religious, and cultural resource to actually restore their nation and their religious practice to its original form. One uh, idea or one historical note here that we, uh, we, we need to understand is uh, there were no synagogues in, in Israel before the deportation. The idea of the synagogue uh, arose when the people were in exile. They had to worship 
in a synagogue, house of prayer, they would meet in homes to pray and to be together, to have fellowship. Eventually, with time, they built meeting places uh, and they would meet there for, they couldn't offer sacrifice, obviously, but they would pray and they would uh, praise God. They would read the, the scriptures, they would teach, they would encourage uh, one another and so on and so forth. And so when they, uh, when they were brought back from exile, uh, they kept that tradition. Uh, yes, they rebuilt the temple, but they also built synagogues in different cities. They brought that uh, tradition back from uh, exile. Anyways, the difference between their two experiences explains why Zerubbabel refuses the offer of his neighbors to participate in the building and by extension, the leadership of the temple worship. This was not pride or selfish. It's not like, oh, you people are not good enough for us. You know, you're second class. It wasn't that. It wasn't selfishness on the part of Zerubbabel and the others. It was a matter of obedience, obedience to God. Uh, and also uh, prudence. Uh, let's face it, the reason that Judah, the southern kingdom, had fallen to the Babylonians in the first place was that uh, they fell into idolatry and they were mixing their religion with the religion of the pagan nations around them and God punished them, destroyed the nation, carried them off into exile. This time they take no chances and they refuse from the outset to mix with foreign peoples and their gods. They resist the temptation to trade peace and security for religious purity. They refuse to compromise. That was a, a key turning point uh, in, the, um, in the success of their uh, building. And so we keep reading in verse four, it says, then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, uh, king of Persia. Now in the reign of Ahasuerus, uh, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Artaxerxes, uh, Bishlam and Mithridath, Tabil and the rest of his colleagues wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the text of the letter was written in Aramaic and translated from Aramaic. So the opposition begins as public pressure. The negative talk and the social pressure to stop what they're doing because it's offensive or I could cause a war. This becomes political when the enemies begin to lobby successive kings to stop permitting the work. Peer pressure and threats don't work, so they appeal to the king with a false accusation. We're not going to read all of it, but in verses 8 to 16, Ezra provides the details of the letter sent to the king in which the Jews are accused of rebuilding their city and temple as a first step to rebelling against the king and uh, claim independence. And so the enemies claim that the Jews end game is to refuse taxation and conquer their neighboring nations as they did in the past. They encourage the king to verify Judah and Israel's history to confirm their uh, accusation. And so their argument is summarized in a very neat equation. Rebuilding the temple equals independence. And in that era, pagans believed that the defeat of a nation meant that your own gods were more powerful than the gods of your defeated enemies. This is why we read over and over again, you know, uh, victorious armies would tear down temples and they would carry off images and vessels of that temple into their own temple as trophies. You know, they, they had the trophies. We they hear the, you know, whatever the, the artifacts from this temple in this city that we destroyed and over here, the temple in Jerusalem, we have the table and all the, all this, you know, we have the, uh, the, um, the candle holder and all these things, you know, uh, this is, uh, you know, a trophy from that particular victory. So when the king read of Israel's past glory and, and power, he didn't want to risk allowing the God of the Jews to be reestablished. I mean, talk about strange thinking. We can't let that God you know, rise up again. You know, we had enough trouble with him in the past. So for him, the simple equation made sense. Stop the building of the temple of the God of the Jews equals stopping the God of the Jews equals stopping the power of the Jews. 
He thought if he could stop the building of the temple, he could stop the God of the Jews uh, that uh, was very powerful or, or, or he read was very powerful in the past. Of course, this letter and attack only confirmed how unsuitable uh, these men were to share in the building of the temple in the first place. A good thing they refused these guys to participate in the rebuilding of the temple because you can imagine the trouble they would have caused. So we read, uh, we've slipped down a little further, down uh, verse 23 and four. It says, then as soon as the copy of the king uh, Artaxerxes document was read before Rehum and uh, Shimshai, the scribe and their colleagues, they went in haste to Jerusalem to the Jews and stopped them by force of arms. The work on the house of God in Jerusalem ceased and it was stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, uh, king of uh, Persia. So note that Rehum and Shimshai only have the courage to use force once they have the backing of the king for their scheme. So in other words, their letters and their, their, you know, the lies that they told worked and they get a letter giving them the authority to tell the Jews, stop the building and we can stop you by force. And so for about 20 years, the construction was stopped until the Lord stirred up the prophets to signal a new beginning. And that gets us to stage number three. And stage number three is renewal. We had the beginning, we have the opposition, we have renewal. Now what we know about the uh, downtime uh, in the rebuilding effort, we learn from the prophet Hag Haggai's uh, preaching. So we'll switch over to Haggai and uh, read a little bit from his book. It says, in the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says, the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Consider your ways, go up to the mountain, bring wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house, which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. That's pretty clear, there is not, don't need a lot of interpretation for that, what God is saying to them, the Jews, did what comes naturally to human beings, right? They took the, past, uh, the path of least resistance. Once the king's decree came, they stopped. They didn't answer, they didn't fight back, they did nothing. They just they said, okay, up, the game's up, we stop, might as well go to our house and build up our houses and I've got to plow my field and so on and so forth. They knew uh, what was written was not true. They knew that it was out of context, but they didn't even appeal it. It was easier to give in to their fear and, pers uh, and pursue the lesser dream of simply rebuilding their homes and their lives and avoid trouble with their neighbors. All they wanted, well, let's just, let's, for peace sake, let's just have peace. Okay, so we, won't have a, we don't have a temple or anything, but at least we'll rebuild our houses and you know, we'll, we'll have peace. And yet, as Haggai says, they didn't prosper as they should have, now that they had all the time in the world to work on their homes and to their businesses and their farms, they had all the time in the world to do that, they didn't, they didn't prosper. Now that they didn't have the time and effort to invest in the rebuilding of the temple, you'd think that all this extra energy and time and money would help them make a better life for themselves, but it didn't. And Haggai, he calls them on it. God asks them to evaluate the last 20 years. Are they really ahead? Are they really better off? The answer of course is no. They're not better off because God has not permitted them to prosper and he has not permitted them to prosper because 
They've neglected to do the work they were originally sent to do. The work of God was to rebuild the temple, not their houses, that was secondary. And he has not permitted them to prosper because they've neglected to do what he has originally sent them there to do. At the first obstacle, they reverted to their own plan instead of trying to figure out another way to accomplish God's plan. Note also that they didn't go to God in prayer. Nobody you know, uh, uh, mourned uh, the, the loss of the permission of the king. Uh, there was none of that. There were no meetings. Uh, they didn't have a special worship to kind of cry out to God. They just said, oh, okay, you know, wash their hands. Let's just get back to working on our, on our houses. So Haggai's preaching works a tremendous result on the people because in two short weeks, in verse one, he says he started on the first day of the sixth month to preach. And then in verse 15, it says that on the 24th day of the same month, the people took action. In two short weeks, the people responded to his preaching. As a preacher who has been preaching for a long time, I can tell you, if you've only preached two sermons and got everybody on board with uh, your agenda, you're doing pretty good. Two weeks is pretty good. So in describing the restoration of the building, Ezra mentions what was at stake here. So we, we flip back to Ezra, we go back to his book. And in Ezra chapter five, it says, when the prophets Haggai uh, the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them, then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua the son of Josadak arose and began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, uh, supporting them. At that time, Tatnai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and uh, Shatar Bozani and their colleagues came to them and spoke to them thus, who issued you a decree to rebuild this temple and to finish this structure? Then we told them accordingly what the names of the men were who were reconstructing this building. But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews and they did not stop them until a report could come to Darius and then a written reply uh, be returned concerning it. So they begin rebuilding and the obvious thing happens. The officials show up and demand to know what's going on. Who gave you permission? You know, this thing was over with, you know, uh, I thought this was done 20 years, you've done nothing. Who gave you permission to start up this work again? And, and note that in verses three and four, the officials, they take names, you know, that expression, I'm gonna go in and do so, such and such and take names, right? So they're taking names. Why? We wanna know who to execute. <laughs> when the king says, yeah, you're right, they shouldn't be rebuilding. Who? Who took on that responsibility? Well, we got the names right here. They're, they'll be the first ones to hang uh, once the king uh, writes back. And so the Jews decide to do what they should have done 20 years before. They fight for their project. They respond to the accusations. In the meantime, someone had to take responsibility in case it didn't work. In verses six to 17, Ezra provides the details of the letters sent by the officials renewing their accusations of the Jew, against the Jews and the letter that the Jews sent this time in defense of their work. The Jews letter summarizes the story of their exile, their return to Jerusalem and the permission that they received from King Cyrus to rebuild their city and their temple. Now it's interesting to note that in their letter, the Jews make no reference to the accusations uh, against them they make no defense of their actions. They, they don't counter any of the charges that were made against them by their enemies. Their letter is simply a witness of their faith in God, their own history, and an appeal to the king to simply verify their claims. You know, they write back and say, look in your records and you'll see we were given permission, basically is what they, they do. And so God's uh, prophets, energized the people not only to renew their organized task, but also ignited their original faith and dependence on God for uh, success. So in this uh, lesson, we see examples forecasted in the subtitle, you know, building without compromise or fear. So let's go over the process, shall we? First of all, there are the beginnings. 
like uh, the start of any uh, communal project or personal improvement or spiritual growth effort, it always starts with high hopes and enthusiasm. And there's a reason for this, because at the beginning we see the goal clearly, because we understand the benefits of achieving the goal, whatever that may be. Uh, we see uh, improved utility or function or comfort for projects, or we see increased faith and spiritual power and offering to God something uh, holy and blessed if our project is a spiritual uh, project. And then a third reason for our optimism at this stage, we don't have any opposition. There's no opposition, there's no suffering on day one of the project. When you get the idea in the, in the discussion, hey, let's do this, yeah, that's a great idea. You know, we've always needed that and so on. There's no opposition. At that point, there's no suffering yet, which brings us inevitably and surely uh, in efforts like these to stage two. So stage one, the beginning enthusiasm, stage two is always, always opposition. It arrives sooner or later, but it always arrives. The, uh, the anguish, the anxiety, the frustration that we experience in every instance of you know, up or, or, or on, which, which is shorthand that refers to build up, grow up, or carry on, or push on, uh, there's always opposition of some kind. I mean, it takes so many forms, and I, I mean this is building a building or building a marriage, same thing. Uh, it's always great at the beginning, but there's always opposition that shows up from uh, uh, obscure building regulations and lack of critical tradespeople or supplies to that universal spiritual growth killer, weakness of the flesh, not to mention the discouragement of worldly non-believers, especially when they are among those who uh, we love and respect, uh, that's terrible. The people we rely on for encouragement, for direction, when they start opposing us, then that really becomes uh, a problem. And so now we can either uh, do one of two things at this stage when the opposition uh, shows up. Uh, one of two things, we can either crumble or we stumble. Crumble or stumble. Crumble, uh, what does that mean? Well, it means we fall apart. Uh, we die inside. Uh, we have no answer to the criticism or the opposition. We have no courage to fight or to struggle or to, to keep on trying uh, or to accept martyrdom so that others can continue in our place instead of saving ourselves at the cost of denying our own dream or our own plan or our own project or belief. You see, to crumble is like a knockout in boxing. You're out, you're unconscious. You're deemed so damaged by the referee that you're not allowed to continue. Now it's less embarrassing to lose by a knockout. You know, you can always say, well, I, I was knocked out. You know, they counted me out. I was unconscious. I couldn't keep fighting, you know, but it's still a loss. You still lost or you have a stumble. A stumble on the other hand is like a knockdown, not a knockout. In a knockdown, the breath uh, is knocked out of you for a moment or your opponent hits you with a punch where you lose your balance and you fall down. And when that happened, the referee does what's called a, a mandatory eight count to make sure that you can continue the match. You know, he counts till eight, he talks to you. Are you okay? Can you hear what I'm saying? Show me your fists, you know, walk towards me. Okay, okay. do you want to continue? Yes, I want to continue. All right, you know, and th that's a mandatory eight count. You lose points from the judges because of a knockdown, but you don't automatically lose the match. You can still come back and win the fight if you're able to get back up and box. In the crumble or stumble stage, a decision needs to be made. Is this a knockout punch that ends everything for good? Or is it a knockdown, a stumble, where I have to accept a temporary setback, or I have to take time for an eight count so I can you know, reassess my plans or my approach or my team or my resources before I carry on? or perhaps seek God's guidance and help in prayer and, and find a fellow believer who can walk me through this difficult moment. Either way, the strategy to avoiding the knockout 
or the crumbling is to expect opposition right from the start. I repeat this point, okay? If there's anything you kind of take away from, from all of this, the way to avoid the knockout is to expect opposition. If you expect opposition, if you expect trouble, if you expect that there will be difficulties, then you're much better prepared uh, to face it when it comes because it will inevitably come. You know, boxers, uh, I, I use the boxing analogy, you know, as you know, my dad was a boxer and I've enjoyed that sport for a long time. Uh, boxers, they train hard in order to come back from the occasional knockdown that all boxers experience. As Christians, we also must always expect and prepare for, for stumbles, for knockdowns. I have all the resources to get back up when I'm knocked down or stumbled. For example, uh, when sin knocks me down, I have the blood of Christ to forgive me every time. First John, right? But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin, all sin. I repeat, all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. In other words, we say, there's nothing wrong with me, I'm fine. Well, then you're deluding yourself. But he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, as we know, this is a familiar passage. He's speaking to Christians here, not to non-Christians. He's saying to Christians, you're going to sin. You're going to get knocked down by temptation, by the devil, by discouragement, by ignorance, whatever it is, you're going to get knocked down. But the blood of Christ is always present. It's always there. It's always ready uh, to forgive you, uh, to enable you to get back up and keep going uh, as a Christian. Uh, then uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm discouraged by opposition and doubt or criticism, uh, I have the assurance of the Holy Spirit and his word that strengthens me. In Philippians 4, Paul says, my favorite scripture, be anxious for nothing. I don't know how many times I've said that to myself. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. When I think, you know the problem is, my problem is I think that something is too small for God's attention. If my, if my wife, is ill, that's a serious thing. I will, I will go to God in prayer on her behalf because I love her and I, you know, I mean, she's my, she's my, she's my everything, you know? So I, I, that's a big thing. Uh, God knows he's got time for that, but I can't seem to figure out how to open the box of cereal. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? These newfangled things that he got, you know, I, I don't get it and I'm, I'm getting more and more frustrated by the moment. Lord, I know this is a small thing. <laughs> he says here, be anxious for nothing. Not if Lise is sick, not if the box of cereal, you can't grapple with it for nothing. Ask, ask. I can rely on the, the Holy Spirit who will help me if I simply ask, and then when I'm weakened uh, by the length of the match or the power of the opposition against me, I have the comfort and the encouragement of the church, which is the embodiment of Christ here on earth. Philemon 1, 7, for I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, uh, brother. When you come here on Sunday, you come to be refreshed, uh, certainly encouraged by the word uh, being spoken, but refreshed by what? Uh, by the presence of one another, the presence of fellow believers. I have that uh, to help me deal with the stumbles, uh, the, you know, uh, the knockdowns in my life. And so knowing, expecting, and having these resources fully enables me or you or any brother or sister to overcome any and every stumble that will surely come our way, whether we are trying to build up the church in some way or build ourselves up in order to be a better reflection of Christ, 
or, or, or build up a, a, a marriage that's been going on for 40 years or that's only been going on for 40 days. One last note about my boxing analogy. In regular non-championship matches, there is what's called the three knockdown rule. This means that if a boxer is knocked down three times in a single round, he automatically loses. Even if he gets up and he's able and willing to continue, he loses. This type of loss is called a TKO, a technical knockout. He wasn't knocked out like uh, unconscious, but because he was knocked down three times in the same round, that's it. They won't allow him to continue. However, in a championship fight, where who will be the champion is decided, there is no three knockdown rule. You hear them say that, no three knockdown rule. So long as you can get up after a knockdown and you're willing and able to continue, you can keep fighting. You see, in a championship fight, they not only test for speed and boxing ability, they also measure what they call a fighter's heart. Does he have the heart to be a champion? That's what they measure in a championship fight. So here's the point. In this life, each one of us are in a championship fight. No three, knock, no three knockdown rule. It's a long and grueling fight with lots of opposition from beginning to end, and it takes many forms, the opposition, temptation, anger, illness that just goes on and on, death of a loved one, disappointments, frustrations, fears, loss, endless suggestions just to quit, each a potential knockout shot, However, if we train properly, regular prayer, regular Bible reading and study, regular worship, regular service in the name of Christ, conscious attempts to grow spiritually in various ways. Could you imagine a boxer not having any training whatsoever at all? He goes for a little uh, one mile run every week, you know, before the championship fight. No, no, my, you know that guy's gonna get killed. What makes us think a spiritual battle is any different, that we don't have to prepare and stay in shape? We can avoid a, a clear knockout and reduce the attack to uh, glancing blows or at worst a knockdown or a stumble that we can recover from in order to carry on. After all, ours is a championship fight for the crown of eternal life. Boxing champion just holds his crown until the next fight. Our crown we hold forever, no one can never take it away from us. And thanks be to God, thanks be to God that he has promised us the victory so long as we get back up to fight after every stumble. Remember, it doesn't matter how, how many knockdowns you suffer, the crown goes to the one who is still fighting when the Lord comes for us in death or at the end of the world. As Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, remain what? Remain faithful until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is the promise. This is why we train. This is the battle that we are in. And this is the reward that we are striving for. This very day we are here we are here because we are striving for this victory right here. Okay, that's our lesson for today. As you notice, we don't have time to read everything in Ezra and Nehemiah. I encourage you to read Ezra 6, 1 to 22 and uh, chapter 13 of uh, Nehemiah. You read those over, be ready for next lesson next week. Thank you very much for your attention. We are dismissed. <laughs>